Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to come to you today on this very special occasion for me. As you know, the Caprini score has uh, become very popular around the world. And the reason for this is all of the wonderful people that have worked on this, shown where it works, shown where it doesn't work, and how best to use the, the tool. And there are two individuals today that are responsible for many advances with this score. And I would like to uh, uh, start by introducing the first of those. And that's Kirill Lobostov, who's Associate Professor of the Department of General Surgery at the Pirogov National, Russian National Medical Research University. He's also the scientific director at a very important initiative in Russia regarding the Thrombosis School Educational Project. In addition, he's a committee member of the National Guidelines on Venous Thromboembolism and Chronic Venous Disease. He has been working in this area and, and he's also focused on the Caprini risk score since 2010, translating it to Russian, translating the, valid, the uh, patient validated form in 2020, and presenting some very important data that have contributed to the success of this score. And when it comes to the success of the score, that means that you are saving patients' lives. And that's what's really important. And he's very, very interested in promoting awareness for venous thromboembolism. Uh, as, as you know, only 32% of the population in a recent survey from the United States even recognized what venous thromboembolism was. And that's amazing after all these years. And he's also in very interested in promoting the Caprini risk score, and he's done so in several areas. Now, the first subject is a very important subject because there's been some data coming up from around the world, including in some prestigious journals, that sequential compression devices may be unnecessary if you're able to use low molecular weight heparin for prophylaxis. And that's really not true. First of all, during the operation, it's a mini microcosm of all the Virchow tri triad factors, venous stasis, hypercoagulability, and, and vascular damage. And in order to counteract those during the anesthetic, it's important to use sequential compression devices. Now, they don't completely prevent all of those changes, but they mitigate them. Now, in addition to that, Kirill has shown the best data available that I've seen anywhere in the world so far, that taking people with high Caprini scores who are validated and using this uh, modality of sequential compression to address the breakthroughs. And some of these patients in Russia are very seriously ill patients undergoing very complex operations. So they have high Caprini scores. And some of them have breakthrough thrombosis despite using low molecular weight heparin. And what he has done, he's shown that in those breakthrough patients, if you add sequential compression devices, you dramatically and statistically significantly lower the incidence of venous thromboembolism with the combination of low molecular weight heparin and sequential compression devices. So, Kail, it's a great pleasure to have you. It's a great pleasure, and I congratulate you for all of your work over the last decade or so promoting venous thrombosis awareness, uh, the score, and resulting in saving patients' lives. So, I'd like you uh, to go ahead now and present your data. Thank you very much, Professor Caprini. It's a big honor to be here and uh, to thank you for this kind introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, show you the results of this uh, uh, interesting uh, trial of the uh, agentive use of intermittent pneumatic compression in patients uh, uh, at extremely high VT risk. Uh, so the results of this uh, study were published in 2021 in Annals of uh, Surgery, and uh, uh, this was uh, the IPC super trial. Uh, so we took patients at extremely high risk of postoperative VT in whom the standard prophylaxis is usually not uh, very effective. So uh, these are personals uh, who have 11 and more Caprini scores. Actually, in such patients, we previously saw that uh, the standard prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin, degraded compression, stockings, it's 
it's not uh, uh, so effective that uh, in other uh, patients and uh, the incidence of postoperative VTE may be as high as 40 or 50 percent uh, predominantly due to the asymptomatic uh, calf muscle weight thrombosis but however further they uh, can progress to proximal uh, deep vein thrombosis and uh, even pulmonary embolism so we designed a such study and in this study all patients received standard prophylaxis with uh, enoxaparin 40 milligrams and uh, graduated compression stockings and in the uh, main group we also used intermittent mer- pneumatic compression device. And uh, uh, this prophylaxis was applied uh, during the all inpatient period of treatment, uh, and uh, the patient were followed up to six months. Uh, during inpatient period of treatment, uh, they underwent duplex ultrasound, which was performed every three, five days after surgery to detect uh, asymptomatic venous thrombosis, uh, which were the primary outcome of this trial. Uh, so the standard prophylaxis included uh, uh, the well-known modalities. It's uh, above knee antibiotic related compression stockings, which were applied before the surgery and patients wear them round the clock uh, in the hospital. And after discharge, we recommended them uh, to use uh, these stockings uh, during the bed rest uh, during uh, the night period. Uh, an exoporin of 40 milligrams was started before the surgery or after the surgery and was continued during uh, the whole inpatient period of treatment. And uh, uh, intermittent pneumatic compression, it was a well-known candle CD device, and uh, it was uh, applied uh, either before surgery surgery or just after the surgery, and uh, uh, it was used around the clock in the intensive care unit, uh, and after patient was transferred to the surgical department, uh, uh, it was used only in the day period, and there was a specific uh, uh, compression-free night period from 0 a.m. to 6 a.m., and it was aimed uh, to increase compliance with uh, uh, this uh, prophylactic approach, because we know that uh, IPC is usually not very comfortable to the patient, especially uh, in the uh, night period. And uh, also, we designed a specific uh, registration card to assess compliance. And uh, uh, the issue of the feature of this uh, card is uh, that an uh, uh, investigator five times a day uh, visited patient in his room and check if the patient is still in bed and uh, the IPC device is applied and also I- if it is turned on. So sometimes uh, the cuffs may be applied, but uh, the device is not working. And this is a negative result out of this uh, compliance assessment. Also, force patients uh, to early activization to early ambulation. So uh, in any moment when the patient wanted to get uh, from his bed uh, to walk, the IPC device was removed uh, and until the patient came back to this to his bed, uh, he can be without uh, IPC device. And this is also was a positive result if the investigator came to the uh, patient's room and found that patient is out of his bed uh, and divide, device is not applied. So it's uh, also positive compliance results. And according to such approach, we calculated uh, uh, this uh, compliance Compliance and it uh, uh, appeared to be uh, rather high. So in our study in the IPC group, the compliance was 95%. It, it is much more higher than the standard uh, 70% even in the intensive care unit uh, department. And uh, maybe the reason, one of the reasons of uh, uh, such result is uh, night-free uh, period without compression, a uh, compression-free period uh, at the night. Uh, and this that we allowed patient to uh, get from the bed uh, without uh, IPC device. Uh, so in this study, we randomized it uh, 407 patients uh, into two groups, and all of them were followed within the inpatient period of treatment. Uh, and uh, at one month, uh, about 95% of patients, and at six months, about 80% of uh, patients uh, were also examined. And uh, actually, it was a rather complicated group of patients, and uh, they had a lot of uh, VT risk factors, as you can find in this diagram. This is risk factors according to the Caprini score, and uh, uh, the mean score was 11, and the score range was from 9 to 23. Uh, actually, the target uh, Caprini score in the study was 11, but however, I just want to stress your attention that Caprini score is a dynamic instrument, and uh, the initial score that is calculated in the beginning of the uh, patient treatment, it may change during uh, the whole period of the treatment, and it may be different uh, in comparison to the final score that we calculate uh, before uh, discharge. And actually, the score may increase because patients uh, can develop some new complications, can have a 
some new risk factors, but also it can decrease. Uh, for example, most of our patients had uh, a very extensive surgery and uh, we suggested that they will have a bad rest of three and more days. And uh, this is uh, the Caprini score of two. But however, some of them, especially those in the IPC group who did not like uh, IPC on their legs, so they tried uh, uh, to get out of their beds uh, more quickly. And that's why the real time of the bed rest was uh, lower than three days. And we suggested Caprini score of 11, but actually it dropped to nine. And uh, uh, that is the reason that it was uh, not uh, uh, always 11. And uh, finally, in the IPC group, uh, we detected only one case of the isolated calf muscle uh, deep pain thrombosis. However, in the control group with the standard prophylaxis with heparins and uh, graduated compression stockings, it was uh, 34 and uh, uh, the using of uh, IPC was associated with the 97% decrease in the risk of asymptomatic vein thrombosis in our uh, study. And not only a distal, not only calf vein thrombosis, which are uh, of course important, but uh, they're not so life threatening like proximal uh, DP, DVT and uh, pulmonary embolism. And uh, uh, those life threatening conditions also were decreased uh, with the use of the IPC device. So there was 10 cases, five cases of proximal DVT and five cases of pulmonary embolism and all pulmonary embolisms that were detected, they were not related to proximal DVT. They were related to distal DVT. They were related to superficial vein thrombosis or even had no any source detected. And uh, that's why there was a significant decrease in the risk of uh, uh, the combination of proximal DVT and pulmonary embolism with the use of intermediate pneumatic compression in this uh, study. What about uh, the risks of uh, IPC? So the only risk is the leg skin injury, and it was not uh, uh, increased significantly in those patients who received IPC. It was on the 12% in comparison to 7.5%. Uh, and uh, usually it was represented by such a superficial injury, superficial lesions of the skin, which uh, uh, recovered without, without any additional treatment. And after discharge, we did not found any uh, new venal thromboembolism events because in the control group all these minor DVT that were revealed they were treated with the uh, therapeutic anticoagulation and uh, no new events appeared and in the main group in the IPC group all these minor DVTs they were prevented by IPC and no new events uh, were detected uh, within six uh, months of uh, follow-up. And uh, uh, what uh, Professor Caprini already told, it's uh, intraoperative use. In our study, there was no any difference between the intraoperative uh, start of intermittent pneumatic compression and postoperative start. But however, in our study, all patients received uh, before the surgery, at least half of them received before the surgery, the first dose of uh, low molecular heparin. And during the surgery, they all were applied with graduated compression stocking. So even when IPC were started after the surgery, during the surgery, intraoperatively, all our patients were protected uh, uh, by graduated compression stockings, and most of them were protected by the first dose of low molecular heparin. So without uh, these measures, uh, intraoperative use of uh, intermediate pneumatic compression may be very important. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude that uh, our study showed that among patients with Caprini score of 11 and more, it is uh, the extremely high risk of postoperative VTE. Uh, who received standard prophylaxis uh, uh, for VT and injunctive for IPC, it resulted in a significantly lower incidence of asymptomatic venous thrombosis. Thank you very much for your attention. Kirill, thank you so much for your uh, uh, presentation. I think that there are some things that I would like to impress upon the audience that uh, need to be said uh, regarding this presentation. First of all, you point out, which is so often forgotten, about the dynamic nature of the score. The score has to be done as you go along. And as you pointed out, sometimes you can even lower the score, but more importantly, more times than not, the score will be elevated. And as a result of that, the there'll be an increase in VTE risk and necessitate post-discharge prophylaxis. The other thing I wanna remind the audience too is that this isn't easy. If you carefully look at the data that he's presented, the attention to detail, 
hounding the, the patients, coming back four and five times a day, making sure they were all doing what they're supposed to be doing. That was, uh, that was part of the reason of the success of this program. So hard work, as usual, is required in order to achieve good results. And I know that's probably why some people don't want to bother with this, because it's a lot of work, but it saves lives. The other thing is long-term follow-up. We know that over half of the patients will get their, uh, three quarters of the patients will get their DVT once they leave the hospital, and half of them after thrombosis prophylaxis is, is stopped. And so we know also that 90-day and, and even longer results are important, and this study is also important in that regard. So finally, I would like to encourage the audience and everyone who, who is interested in this subject to go test it in your own population. See about these results, but remember to collect the data prospectively and make sure it's co collected properly and all the factors are collected. So again, I would like to thank you for your presentation, and I will uh, hope that everyone will view these and also go out and work on it and make this an even better program around the world. Hello, everyone. This is a very important set of presentations for me. And the next presentation comes from my dear friend and colleague, Tomas Urbanik, who's from Krakow, Poland. And um, uh, Tomas and I have a long history. And over a decade ago, he invited me to Poland and we talked about the score and how to use it and so on and so forth. And it's another example. This score has been very, very successful. But the reason it's successful has nothing to do with me. It's all about the wonderful people around the world that have worked on this score and made this score great. And for example, just as a diversion, it's the only score in the world that talks about obstetrical complications. Now, the reason that the obstetrical complications are in there comes from Dr. Holly Cassells, who was a famous maternal fetal medicine specialist at our, uh, at our hospital. And when I was putting the score together, she said, you better put in these complications for women. They're very important. And it's the only place that you'll find them. And it's, of course, another typical example of how women have been underserved. So that's a very important point. And don't forget, and I would just throw out at the beginning, I don't care what score you use. There are many roads to Rome. And, and depending on where you are, you may have to use different scores. But you really need to make sure that you're tracking things like obstetrical complications. Meanwhile, back to Professor Robonik. He practices general and vascular surgery and vascular medicine and is a professor of vascular surgery at the Medical University of Silesia in Katowice in Poland. He's chair of the American Venus Forum International Committee, a board member of the European Venus Forum, and a member of the European Board of Phlebology. He's past president of the Polish Society of Phobology, as well as an organizer of the International Union of Phobology chapter meeting, which was held in Krakow in 2019 in Poland. His fields of interest include, of course, venous thromboembolism, prophylaxis and treatment, compression therapy, and, prevent and the pathogenesis and treatment of chronic venous disease. So it's a great pleasure, Tomas, uh, to have you join this group and uh, you've been a very important contributor to improving healthcare around the world and, and, and promoting a VTE awareness in Poland. And uh, we've just heard this wonderful presentation from Kirill Lovostov regarding sequential compression. And now that we're all here, I'd like you to give us your reflections on the, uh, the presentation about central com uh, sequ sequential compression and questions of what needs to be done going forward. Dear Professor Caprini, dear Kirill, first of all, thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's always a great pleasure and honor, honor for me to, to meet Professor Caprini and uh, welcome Kirill to his, uh, this wonderful presentation on, on this study, which for me is very important. And uh, Kirill, I have some questions and comments regarding IPC because uh, for some reason it's still very difficult to implement this in the practice in our hospital. In my hospital, we have IPC, but uh, still we need to work a lot on the practical implementation because there are some barriers and some problems with the practical use of this, starting from the nurse staff uh, through the physician and also the understanding of uh, IPC, why, what for, and who is the best patient for this kind of approach is still difficult. So if we have all this data that this method is much better 
at least in some conditions. So then, for example, normal graduated compression stocking. And in some cases, so if we add this to the standard pharmacological prophylaxis, it's much more efficient, as you documented, in several patients. So why it's still so difficult to have this in the guidelines, but especially in the daily Medicaid practice? This is first question. And second, which is for me very important from the clinical point of view, does it mean from your study results that IPC, we should use only in the highest risk of VT, like Caprini score 11 and over? Or is this the method which will be beneficial also for the patient with Caprini score 5, 6, 7? Because we have various groups of patients. We have laparoscopic surgery. We have uh, uh, bariatric surgery. We have patients who are immobilized for several hours on the operating table and afterwards. Uh, so should we book this just for this highest risk when, uh, where you show the, the extremely benefits of this method? Or it's this method to really widely use in the medical world? What's your opinion about this? Thank you very much, Thomas, for these uh, very clever comments and questions. And uh, uh, what about the first question? Uh, really, there is a problem in my hospital, in my country as well. The first problem may be the price of the devices, particularly in my country, they are uh, relatively expensive. So not uh, every hospital can allow to have it in uh, uh, enough amounts. And the second problem is the compliance. The compliance is, uh, depends not only on the patients, uh, uh, which uh, sometimes reject the they are uncomfortable with uh, IPC, but uh, also medical staff, as you mentioned. So nurses usually have some difficulties in applying, removing all these uh, cuffs to turn, turning on, turning off all these devices. And of course, they are big, they are loud, they should be connected to electricity. And uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, issues together, they lead to a relatively low compliance in relation to medical staff and patients as well. So I think it is the main problem, but however, for today's some modern devices appear as they are portable, as they do not need to be connected with electricity, they can be carried by the patients, and maybe these uh, uh, new approaches will increase the compliance with the uh, intermediate neurotic compression as the uh, very heterogeneous uh, group of uh, methods of me for mechanical VT prophylaxis. Uh, and uh, what about uh, the second question? Actually, IPC, IPC uh, was uh, always suggested as an alternative for anticoagulation and all these previous studies of this meta-analysis show that uh, the efficacy of IPC without any additional anticoagulation or even without additional elastic compression stockings is uh, uh, the same in comparison with uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. So the first application, it's a group of patients at the highest uh, risk of bleeding. It's neurosurgery, it's uh, relatively often a plastic surgery because plastic surgeons uh, are afraid of for all these uh, uh, extensive hematomas in the soft tissues, which uh, can uh, reduce aesthetic effects uh, of uh, their procedures. So in this situation, even in the moderate risk group, IPC may be very useful, even in patients who have uh, a two, three, and four Caprini score. Of course, in patients who have five, six, seven, the standard uh, high risk group, it also may be as alternative uh, to the uh, pharmacological prophylaxis. Uh, we have uh, limited data about the high risk group, those who have 8, 9, and 10 Caprini score because in this situation it was not investigated, but uh, I believe that uh, it uh, uh, may be already effective as an uh, adjunctive method to standard prophylaxis. And of course, uh, in 11 and more Caprini scores, the extremely high risk uh, group, it is uh, uh, effective as adjunctive prophylaxis as showed uh, this trial. One more comment, because I believe that there will be also people who are practicing this kind of prophylaxis watching us, uh, should we always use this with uh, compression stocking together or can we go just for uh, IPC only because this can generates also some cost of the treatment. You mentioned that this is one of the problems. So if we want IPC cuffs plus uh, graduated compression stockings or tie length stocking, this is uh, even much more so. How this looks in your practice and it's obligatory or this is just the solution because in the initial studies, this was together right now. We really don't know if we should provide this both kinds of uh, mechanical prophylaxis together. 
Yes, uh, we have some studies which shows at least uh, that there is no any hemodynamic benefits where in combining IPC with graduated compression stockings. Uh, but however, maybe in patients with the moderate or high VT risk in whom IPC is being used as alternative to prophylactic anticoagulation, maybe in this situation, because uh, uh, the risk is not so high, uh, we can use uh, separately, we can use uh, just uh, uh, IPC without uh, uh, mechanical, uh, without uh, uh, gradated compression stockings. Uh, uh, but uh, however, in the highest risk, 9, uh, 11 Caprini scores, in this situation, I believe that the combination of all mechanical methods uh, um, should be beneficial in such patients. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much. It's been a very interesting discussion. And I would just like to highlight First of all, the discussion is an illustration of how important you two have been in promoting VTE awareness in your countries and trying to spread the word. And I, I admire that in both of you. The other thing that I want to say is that recently, Alan Davies and his associates in England showed us a study that uh, the compression stockings in medical patients didn't add anything to the use of low molecular weight heparin. And I think that uh, that's, that's an important point that, that I think Tomas is bringing up is that for most patients, especially when cost is an issue, that that is something that can be eliminated. And, and uh, uh, Kiri, when I looked at the, the complications in your, in your study, it looks to me like they were related to the stockings because they were around the foot and ankle and SCD devices don't cause problems around the foot and ankle. So now all of that having been said, one of the advantages of a stocking, which has not really been talked about, despite the fact that it has no real hemodynamic effects, is the fact that it, it, it acts to, to help prevent perspiration and sweating underneath the compression devices. And so for some people, it may increase the compliance. But anyway, all of that having been said, I think that this has been a wonderful dissertation on compression and anticoagulation. And I thank you all for participating. And I, I look forward to our next uh, video. Music